three schools, kindergarten, still on track for first July reopening. Local authorities to monitor private pools for SOP compliance. Welcome to News on 2, I'm Bradley Paul. We start with the COVID-19 updates to the country. Malaysia recorded three new COVID-19 cases today, taking the total number of infections in the country to 8,590. Health Director General Datuk Dr. Noor Hisham Abdullah in a statement posted on Facebook said nine cases have been discharged, which means 8,186 patients have recovered from COVID-19 since the outbreak began. Malaysia's COVID-19 recovery rate is now at 95.3% out of the total number of positive cases. Dr. Noor Hisham also noted that no new death, which means the death toll remains at 121 cases. He added that there are now only 283 active cases being treated at health facilities nationwide, including three in intensive care units, ICU. According to the statement, all the three cases reported today were locally transmitted, involving two non-citizen and a local. The reopening of preschools and kindergartens will not be postponed as working parents have no other place to send their children. Deputy Education Minister Dato Dr. Ma Hang Soon said this when asked to respond to the National Union of the Teaching Professions NUTP suggestion to postpone the reopening from the scheduled 1st of July. Perlu diteruskan ya. Jadi kalau saya rasa lah ada sekolah kalau prasekolah yang mempunyai masalah ke nanti kita cuba selesaikan masalahnya. Jadi persiapan telah kita buat tahu bahawa ibu bapa yang kerja memang memerlukan anaknya dihantar ke prasekolah ya. Yesterday, NUTP President Aminuddin Awang said most preschools and kindergartens were not prepared for operations due to the constraints on infrastructure to meet the SOP set by the government. He said the facilities at each preschool are different and problems would occur if social distancing is implemented, such as not being able to support the number of pupils, among others. Nearly all business activities have been allowed to resume under the current Recovery Movement Control Order, RMCO, after the country was effectively shut down for two months starting 18 March to contain the spread of COVID-19. Operators of private pools must register with relevant authorities to allow for compliance monitoring and other enforcement. Expanding on his announcement yesterday, Senior Minister Datu Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob today said the Housing and Local Government Ministry as well as the local authorities will be responsible for ensuring that standard operating procedures, SOP, are followed. In a statement that this is applicable to recreational activities in pools and operators are required to register the opening of their pools with the International Trade and Industry Ministry at notification.miti.gov.my. In his press conference yesterday, Dazu Sri Ismail Sabri announced the reopening of swimming pools and other recreational water activities from the 1st of July onwards with the exception of water theme parks. Among the compulsory conditions include the presence of an on-site lifeguard or supervisor and a limited number of people using the pool at any one time, depending on its size and capacity. The water's chlorine content, social distancing and showers before and after entering the pool are also among the SOPs. Swimming activities at beaches, lakes, rivers were also allowed but subject to guidelines. Meanwhile, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said foreigners whose social visit passes expired during the Movement Control Order MCO period can go to immigration offices to get their passes extended. The senior minister also said that for foreigners whose social visit passes ends during the recovery MCO, they can go straight to the airport to go back to their respective countries and this has to be done within 14 days of the end of the recovery MCO.
Last week, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said that foreigners with expired visas have no excuse not to renew them during the recovery MCO as immigration offices are now open. He said if foreigners want to stay for a longer period, they must renew their visa. The minister made the comments after he was asked to clarify reports that some Indian tourists whose visas had expired were among those detained during recent operations against illegal immigrants. During the previous MCO, where immigration officers were close. Those whose visas expired were only required to show their airline tickets when leaving the country to travel back home. The government has paid out 40 million ringgit to 40,000 recipients of Bantuan Prehati Nasional BBN cash aid through Bank Simpana Nasional BSN branches nationwide between the 12th to 19th June. Finance Minister Tengku Dato Sri Zafrul Aziz said, as at 19 June, a total of 10.19 million recipients had received the cash aid, bringing the total payout of BPN to 10.88 billion ringgit, an implementation level of 97%. In the meantime, the minister also announced that 181,000 approved appeals for the BPN aid will start to receive their payouts beginning tomorrow. Pada minggu lalu, saya berkongsi bahawa 181,000 rayuan BPN yang diluluskan akan menerima bayaran bernilai 162 juta ringgit pada akhir bulan ini. Suku cita saya berkongsi bahawa bayaran ini akan dibuat melalui esok, ya, 24 hari bulan Jun. This assistance is expected to ease the burden of all potential BPN recipients. He said this when presenting the 10th implementation report on Prihatin Rakyat Economic Stimulation Package, Prihatin, and National Economic Recovery Plan, Panjana, on his Facebook page today. Still to come, country's debt could hit 55%. Government to maintain fiscal discipline. news on to. Police have taken down the statement of Sagambut Member of Parliament, Hannah Yeo, to facilitate investigations over social media posts deemed seditious recently. Yeo arrived at Bukit Aman just before 10 a.m., accompanied by her two lawyers, Gobin Singh Deo and Shahrezan Johan, after which her statement was recorded by an investigating officer for about an hour. Saya telah uh, memaklumkan kepada polis sekali lagi bahawa kenyataan yang mereka siasat itu uh, merupakan satu kenyataan palsu yang saya tidak pernah cakap dan saya telah pun menjelaskan melalui sosial media saya iaitu Facebook dan Twitter pada 11 hari bulan Mac. Itu adalah fitnah kenyataan palsu yang telah dibuat oleh pihak yang tidak bertanggungjawab. Gobin told reporters that Yeo had surrendered her mobile phone and passwords of her social media accounts to help police investigations. Bukit Aman Criminal Investigation Department Assistant Director, Prosecution and Legal, DCP Mio Faridala Trash Wahid confirmed that the former Women, Family and Community Development Deputy Minister was at Bukit Aman this morning to record a statement in connection with a recent post on social media. The case is being investigated under Section 4 of the Sedition Act 1948, Section 505 of the Penal Code and Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act 1998. On the 11th of June, police had opened an investigation paper on a Facebook account posting belonging to one Hana Yo, which was deemed seditious and inflammatory. Former Deputy Prime Minister Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid Hamidi has failed in his appeal against the dismissal of his application to consolidate his 12 criminal breach of trust CBT charges over funds belonging to Yayasan Akalbudi to become three. This follows a unanimous decision by the three-man bench of the Court of Appeal today to dismiss Datu Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid's appeal against the decision made by Kuala Lumpur High Court Judge Colin Lawrence Aquera on the 8th of November last year. Yeah. Justice Dato Yaakob Matsam, who led the bench, said that the panels found that there was no appealable error from the High Court in dismissing Dato Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid's application. 
The other judges on the bench were P. Ravindran and Dato Ahmad Nasfi Yassin. Judge Sequeira made the decision after finding that the present 12 charges against the former Deputy Premier are clear and the accused could not understand them for preparing his defence, thus not raising any issue of prejudice. Moreover, he ruled that Section 153, Subsection 2 of the Criminal Procedure Code does not make it mandatory for the prosecution to combine the charges. The trial before Judge Sequeira was set to continue on the 3rd of July. Earlier, Dr. Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid's lawyer, Hisham Te Poktek, submitted that the application to consolidate the 12 charges to become three was meant to prevent unfairness and prejudice to his client. Deputy Public Prosecutor Ahmad Sazili Abdul Khairi, however, said fairness is not based on the perception but must be based on law. The Court of Appeal was told today that Petroleum National Berhad Petronas has given the undertaking to withdraw its appeal against the Kuching High Court's decision that Sarawak is entitled to collect sales tax on petroleum products. Sarawak Legal Counsel Dato Sri J.C. Fong told a three-member bench that in view of the undertaking by Petronas to withdraw the appeal, the Sarawak State was not objecting to the postponement application made by the oil and gas company. Petronas Council Dato Male Imtia Sawa informed the court that by way of a letter dated yesterday, Petronas had asked for the appeal hearing to be adjourned for reasons set out in the letter. For that reason, the hearing scheduled for today has been reverted to mention of the matter, said Dato Male, who then requested the court to set the 3rd of August for mention of the appeal. Outside the court, Dato Male told reporters that the appeal was adjourned to the 3rd of August to allow Petronas to finalise the terms of settlement with the Sarawak state. Justice Dato Sri Kamaluddin Maj said, who led the appellate court bench, allowed the adjournment and fixed the 3rd of August for mention. The other two judges presiding were P. Ramindran and Dato Abu Bakar Jais. On March 13 this year, the Kuching High Court ruled that Article 95B, Subsection 3 of the Federal Constitution provided that the legislature of Sabah and Sarawak may make laws for the imposition of sales tax. The wage subsidy program, which is being implemented by the government to address COVID-19 and its impact on the country's economy, has saved 2.4 million jobs. Finance Minister Tengku Dato Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz said, although Malaysia's unemployment rate is expected to increase in this coming months, measures under the Prihatin Rakyat Economic Stimulus Package, Prihatin, were aimed at reducing the unemployment rate. As at 19 June, 4.89 billion ringgit had been approved for almost 303,600 employers for the benefit of over 2.4 million workers, compared with 1.2 billion ringgit for 159,000 employers involving 1 million workers on 19 April. Dengan usaha ini diganding dengan pembukaan hampir ke semua sektor ekonomi. Kerajaan mensasarkan kadar yang bertambah baik terutamanya pada suku ketiga dan keempat tahun ini insyaallah. Sejajar dengan itu pelbagai program program peningkatan kemahiran ataupun upskilling melalui penjana juga bertujuan untuk memelihara kapasiti tenaga kerja kita agar sektor perniagaan boleh berkembang semula dengan kadar segera apabila ekonomi kembali pulih. The government has unveiled Prihatin worth 260 billion ringgit, followed by the National Economic Recovery Plan Panjana worth 35 billion ringgit. Malaysia's unemployment rate rose to 5.0% in April due to the closure of various sectors of the economy during the Movement Control Order MCO and Conditional Movement Control Order CMCO to contain COVID-19 in March and April. For comparison, the current unemployment rate in the Philippines is 17.7%. 23.5%, the United States 13.3% and China 5.9%. Many European countries are also experiencing a double-digit unemployment rate. Meanwhile, Tengku Dato Sri Zafrul said the country's debt level could hit the statutory limit of 55% of gross domestic product at the end of the year from the current 52%. However, he stressed that the government is very committed in reducing the fiscal deficit to below 4% within the next three to four years. Yeah. Malaysia diunjurkan meningkat kepada 5.8% hingga 6%. 
dan tahap hutang kita pada masa ini lebih kurang 52% mungkin akan mencecah had perkanun 55% pada akhir tahun ini. Ini adalah berikutan pelaksanaan langkah-langkah prihatin dan penjana untuk menyelamatkan nyawa dan penghidupan dan merangsang ekonomi. Prior to this, the 2020 budget had projected a deficit of 3.4%. The Employees Provident Fund, EPF, has connected five additional platforms from six fund management institutions, FMIs, to iInvest, the fund's self-service online investment facility. In a statement released today, the EPF said the additional platforms will enhance EPF members' flexibility when conducting members' investment scheme, MIS, transactions online, which is a core objective of iInvest. The platforms are from Afin Wang Asset Management Berhad, Kenanga Investors Berhad, RHB Asset Management Sendiran Berhad, sharing its platform with RHB Islamic International Management Berhad, Hongleong Asset Management Berhad, and TA Investment Management Berhad. The statement said there is now a total of 10 FMI platforms directly connected to iInvest. The previous five pilot platforms were from Amanas Saham Nasional Berhad, East Spring Investment Berhad, Manulife Investment Management Berhad, Principal Asset Management Berhad, and Public Mutual Berhad. FMIs without their own platforms of investment products on iInvest through the two appointed institutional UTS advisors which are IFAS Capital Sandra Berhad and Philip Mutual Berhad. The EPF said up to 30th April this year, iInvest has recorded approximately 25,000 transactions with an overall value of 219.3 million ringgit. The EPF has strict guidelines for FMIs to comply with to safeguard the integrity of the MIS and the best interests of participating members as well as to ensure that FMIs carry out their duties ethically and competently. With that, we conclude this evening's news on Zoom. In our top story, preschools, kindergarten still on track for first July reopening. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon for more updates from around the world. Till then, I'm Brendan Paul. Stay tuned to TV2 and have a pleasant evening.